Anyone who's recently been a parent and has looked into the uh, child rearing manuals can sympathize with this uh, frazzled mom. Now, uh, here are some sobering facts about uh, research on parenting. Most studies of parenting are useless. The studies that uh, gave rise to all of this advice for mothers. Why are they useless? Because they don't control for heritability. They measure some behavior uh, in the parents. They measure some trait in the children. They show there's a correlation, and they assume that correlation implies causation. It must have been the parenting behavior that shaped the child in that manner. Much of this research doesn't even test the possibility that parents uh, transmit genes to their children as well as an environment. And so, for example, the fact that parents who talk more to their children have kids with better language skills or parents who spank their children have children who grow up to be violent may come because there are genes that uh, predispose children to being more articulate or uh, more violent. There are studies that do control for inheritance. For example, redoing the, uh, retesting for the correlations in uh, adopted children who do get parenting uh, experience from their parents, but not their genes. And here are the two findings that turn up over and over again in study after study. One of them is that siblings separated at birth end up as similar as siblings reared together. Now, remember the Malifert twins. Separated at birth, they bump into each other at the patent office with identical contraptions in their lap. Okay, that's one discovery, but that's not the one that I'm talking about here. A second discovery from that research, which is less well appreciated, but equally important, is that if the Malifert twins had, been, had grown up together in the same house with the same parents, they would have been no more similar than they, are, uh, than they would have been if they had been separated. Uh, similarly, for biological siblings, those who are separated and brought up in different homes are no more different than those brought up in the same home. Corroborating that set of studies are ones that look at similarities among adopted siblings who don't share genes but do share an environment and find that they're not similar at all in adulthood, uh, in personality or intelligence. Uh, they are no more correlated than pairs of people plucked off the street at random. Well, what are the implications? Uh, the implications are that the intellect and personalities of children are shaped not by parents, but by a combination of factors, in part, although only in part, by genes, uh, in part by the surrounding culture, both the culture of the society as a whole and the children's own culture, which we call a peer group, and in part by chance chance events in the wiring of the brain in utero in the first few years of life and perhaps chance experience. Now, I found that when people uh, hear these results, which are, uh, were first brought to the public attention by Judith Rich Harris uh, in her book, The Nurture Assumption, they often have the following reaction. So you're saying it doesn't matter how I treat my children. <laughs> now, uh, it's, it may be a natural reaction at first, but think about it. Uh, of course it matters how you treat your children. It's never okay to abuse uh, or belittle or neglect children because that's a terrible thing for a big strong person to do to a small helpless one who is under that person's care. Child rearing, above all, is a moral responsibility. Also, um, let's say someone told you that you can't shape the personality of your spouse. Now, no one but a newlywed really believes that you can change the personality <laughs> of your spouse. Nonetheless, on, on hearing this uh, bit of wisdom, uh, no one says, oh, so you're saying it doesn't matter how I treat my spouse. <laughs> well, of course it matters how you treat your spouse. It matters to the quality of the relationship that you have uh, and the degree of pleasure and respect and uh, depth that your relationship will enjoy. Likewise, Parenting is a human relationship between two people, one of whom is a parent, one of whom is a child, and how the parent treated the child in childhood is going to affect the quality of that relationship. And I think it's a sign of the uh, influence of the blank slate that so many people could forget this simple truth, or at least when intellectualizing they can forget it, and think of parenting only as the molding or micromanaging of a child's uh, personality, when, whereas in fact it's much more than that. Um, let me more quickly go over the, the remaining two fears. The fear of determinism, determinism in the old philosophy sense is the opposite of free will, runs as follows. 
If behavior is caused by a person's biology, he can't be held responsible for it. And in fact, the fear is not totally groundless. Here is a headline that I clipped out of the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago. Man's genes made him kill his lawyer's claim. <laughs> Honest. You can uh, insert your favorite lawyer joke here. Now, uh, by the way, the defense was not successful. Uh, the, this man's genes did not get him off the hook, but there's a clear fear that in the future uh, we have to worry about this. Well, the reason the defense didn't work is, uh, I think, fairly obvious. It comes from the old saying, to understand is not to forgive. Standards of responsibility, uh, credit, blame, reward, punishment, are themselves causes of behavior. These standards don't have to appeal to a ghost or an immaterial soul, but rather to certain parts of the brain, presumably concentrated in the prefrontal lobes, that can inhibit behavior. We can retain this influence on the brain systems for inhibition, namely holding people responsible, even as we come to understand the brain systems for temptation. Um, also, the bogus defenses for bad behavior that have uh, made the news from our judicial system are in fact more likely to be environmental than biological uh, anyway. They include the abuse excuse with which the uh, Menendez brothers uh, got off the hook in their first trial by saying that the reason that they had to kill their parents is that they abused them when they were children. The black rage syndrome that the uh, radical lawyer William Kunstler proposed as a defense of the Long Island Railroad gunman who began shooting passengers at random. It was because of the stress of living in a racist society. The patriarchy made me do it defense that some lawyers have used to try to get rapists off the hook, that they were inflamed by uh, pornographic images in a misogynistic society. And perhaps the, the best example comes from uh, West Side Story, in which the juvenile delinquents tell the local police sergeant, Dear kindly Sergeant Krupke, you gotta understand, it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks. Golly, Moses, naturally, we're punks. <laughs> the final fear is the most nebulous. It's the fear of nihilism. The idea that biology strips life of all meaning and purpose. It says that love, beauty, and morality are just figments of a brain pursuing selfish evolutionary strategies. And a, a nice illustration of this uh, fear comes from uh, the following comic strip in which our hero, Arlo, is pacing the floors uh, late at night, unable to sleep, racked with doubt. He says to his son, why am I here? And the boy says, to pass on your genes. <laughs> you still here? <laughs> Admittedly, uh, most people are not satisfied with this answer to the question. Now, uh, I have to add that this is not just, uh, although it's often a uh, fear expressed by uh, people with, with uh, certain religious beliefs, it's not just a uh, religious worry, but it's a secular worry as well. But I'll, dis I'll discuss the religious version of this fear and the secular version separately. The religious version runs uh, uh, more or less as follows, that people need to believe in a soul which seeks to fulfill God's purpose and is rewarded or punished in an afterlife. Now, I, don't, I want to make it clear that I don't, I don't intend to argue uh, that, that uh, against religion or that people should not be religious uh, or that there's necessarily an incompatibility between religion and science. There are a number of brilliant uh, neurobiologists and evolutionary biologists who believe that there's nothing incompatible between Darwin's theory of evolution or the belief that the mind is completely a product of the brain and some kind of uh, belief in a, um, uh, a supreme being. Um, and I don't want to take on that debate. Uh, my goal is more defensive. I want to argue against the position that only religion uh, is, uh, can be the source of our uh, moral values. And here's why, in particular, the belief in an immaterial soul uh, and an afterlife. And, and here's the response to that accusation uh, from religion. First of all, um, I don't see anything so um, ennobling about a belief in a life to come because it necessarily devalues life on Earth. And think about what we conclude when we remind ourselves that life is short, or what we do. We uh, renew a friendship. We uh, bury the hatchet in a, uh, a silly dispute. We offer a gesture of affection. Uh, we vow not to squander our time and to use it wisely. 
I would argue that nothing gives life more value than the realization that every moment of consciousness is a precious gift. Also, God's purpose sounds good in the abstract, but uh, in practice it always seems to be conveyed by human beings, and that opens the door to uh, a great deal of mischief. Um, I'm going to... Uh, uh, many of you uh, have seen the wonderful satirical newspaper called The Onion with its uh, mock news stories. And about a year ago, they ran the following headline, Hijackers surprised to find selves in hell. <laughs> we, expected, we expected eternal paradise for this, say suicide bombers. Now, admittedly, this was criticized for being tasteless, and it is. Uh, but I think it does make an important point. Uh, uh, namely, that uh, yes, it may be true that without a belief in an afterlife, there might be some people who are uh, not deterred from uh, committing evil acts by the uh, threat of spending eternity in hell. But on the other hand, uh, they wouldn't be tempted to commit evil acts by the promise of spending eternity in heaven. Now, what about the secular version? Well, I think this is um, a, uh, nicely captured, and the flaws of it are, are quite apparent, in uh, the opening scene of Annie Hall, in which the young Woody Allen, uh, seven years old, has been taken to the family doctor by his mother. The doctor says, uh, why are you depressed, Alvy? The mother answers for him. It's something he read. Something he read, huh? The universe is expanding. <laughs> the universe is expanding? Well, the universe is everything, and if it's expanding, someday it will break apart, and that would be the end of everything. His mother says, what is that your business? He stopped doing his homework. <laughs> and Alvy says, what's the point? <laughs> now, clearly Alvy has gone wrong here, and the reason, uh, I think, is beautifully pointed out by his mother, uh, frequently a, a source of wisdom. Uh, who says to him, what has the universe got to do with it? You're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. Uh, indeed, Brooklyn is not expanding. The reason that we, uh, that we laugh at this... Uh, the reason we laugh at this interchange is we realize that the young Woody Allen has confused two different levels of analysis. The human level, what is meaningful to us and how we want to live our lives today, given the brains that we have, and the causal level of how and why our brains uh, cause us to have those thoughts uh, to begin with. They're related, but they're not the same, and it's important not to confuse them. Even if evolution is an amoral process with no purpose, in which genes, according to the metaphor, selfishly uh, maximize copies of themselves, that doesn't mean that people are also amoral or purpose, uh, purposeless or selfish, only the process that uh, led them to evolve had those properties. My final point is that um, morality uh, certainly is not a, uh, a hallucination or a fiction invented by our brains, but there is an inherent logic in it that the human moral sense can be thought to implement, uh, a point made uh, by uh, centuries of philosophers, but I think best illustrated once again in the uh, comic strips. Uh, in this case, from the uh, late lamented cartoon Calvin and Hobbes, in which Calvin uh, lays out for us uh, why we can't abandon morality or treat it as a fiction by showing the consequences of trying to do exactly that. So one day Calvin says, I don't believe in ethics anymore. As far as I'm concerned, the ends justify the means. Get what you can while the getting is good, that's what I say. Might makes right. The winners write the history books. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, so I'll do whatever I have to and let others argue about whether it's right or not. Hey, why'd you do that? You were in my way. Now you're not. The ends justify the means. I didn't mean for everyone you dolt, just me. Ah. Uh, what this cartoon shows is the uh, inherent untenability of any system in which you would try to get other people to treat you in a manner different from the one that you are committed to treat other people. That logic, the golden rule if you will, is the core of morality and it's no coincidence that it's been independently rediscovered by many of the world's religions and uh, great moral traditions. 
So to sum up, the, uh, I've argued that the dominant theory of human nature in modern intellectual life uh, is composed of the doctrines of the blank slate, the noble savage, and the 